And uh, I'm going to read the first four verses. A lot of people still traveling for Thanksgiving, so uh, continue to pray for people that might be traveling, family members and so on. Continue to pray for those that could be traveling. We want them to to get home safe. We want them to be safe. Judges 16, first four verses. Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot went in unto her. And it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson is come hither. And they passed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning when it is day, we shall kill him. Samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. I want to just use this as a title tonight, Fatal Distractions. Fatal Distractions. Would you bow your head with me? Would you go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to help us tonight? Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Your word is so wonderful and fine, so awesome and truthful, so incredibly strong, and we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth. We thank you, God, for the anointing of the word. God, we ask, oh God, that our minds and our hearts will be anointed tonight. Ask God my voice be anointed tonight. I ask you, Lord Jesus, that the words of the Lord that come forth tonight would pierce to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Oh, God, we need saved. We need saved. We cannot allow ourselves, Lord Jesus, these fatal distractions. But, oh, God, help us. Help us, Lord. In the, <coughs> excuse me, in the name of Jesus Christ, we give you glory. We give you honor, Father. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, your holy God, your mighty King, your mighty King. We love you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn around and tell somebody, don't be distracted. Now, will you believe that with me? If you believe that, you can be seated. Notice these guys that don't believe it. You're so distracting, Lou. <laughs> I have a story that I want to read to you. It was October 2003. Some of you may remember this. Tragedy struck at the Mirage Hotel in Las Vegas. By the way, I was not there. While performing... Siegfried and Roy, Siegfried and Roy, is that how you say their names? Siegfried and Roy? The world famous show came to an abrupt end when Roy Horn, one of the stars of the show, was attacked by a 230 pound white Bengal tiger. Does anybody remember this? Roy brought the tiger and announced to the crowd that this is his first show. And all of a sudden, the tiger grabbed the arm of Roy. Roy hit the tiger on the head with a microphone, and just a split second, the tiger knocked him down and latched right onto the back of Roy's head. He was piercing his neck, piercing his skull, and the tiger drug him off the stage. 
Some people thought it was part of the show. Until Siegfried came out and announced that the show was over. A lot of audience members thought that, and they, they said they heard Roy screaming and yelling as trainers ran behind the curtain to help him. But today, Roy Horn is paralyzed. Many still don't. No, they don't understand. They don't under. They don't want. They wonder why. What caused that tiger to do what he did? But you got to know, somehow or another, the tiger became distracted. It had been trained to, to be in front of the the roaring crowds. It had been trained to, to 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 fit inside of whether people are screaming or whether people are in just silent awe. The tiger had been trained for every circumstance, but something that night distracted him. Something caused the trainer and the tiger to lose focus, and it could have definitely become fatal. A distraction at any level can become fatal. We live in a day where people drive down the road with these things, texting. And I don't know about you, but I see different things on YouTube, and I see different things that people post on Facebook and all kinds of different social sites of, uh, of the next person or the last person, I should say, that has fatally been distracted. Currently, the law says that you cannot text while driving, but it says nothing about surfing the Internet while driving. It says nothing about watching YouTube while driving. It says nothing about watching movies and playing games and all that. You just cannot text while driving. I was driving alongside somebody the other day, and, and here they were sitting there like this watching a movie, driving around. I thought, are we so, I'll just say it, stupid that we cannot leave media alone for even a 20-minute drive? Have we really become so infected by media that we cannot just set it aside? and get done focused on what we need to be focused on. What in the world is wrong with people that are, that are so, everything is so sensationalized that I've got to have my beloved device. I don't know how I ever grew up. Obviously, I'm messed up. I didn't have anything like this as a kid. Had I had it as a kid, I still don't think I would have been glued to it. I was too busy operating a shovel to worry about a phone. A distraction at any level can be fatal. We don't realize it. We don't realize it. Now they are hiring people to go into schools and talk to kids. Kids that shouldn't even have a phone, right? What do you need one for? Honestly, you have something that important? You have, you have your boss calling you that you got to have a phone? Yeah? Yeah? Parents my age that never had these things say, well, my kids need to get a hold of me in case of emergency. How did we get a hold of anybody in case of an emergency? We're still alive. Apparently, when we had emergencies, we figured out how to do stuff. Yep. 
If there's not a need, church, there's not a need. These things can be fatal. I've watched it tear young people to shreds. I've watched social media become nothing more than just a whole bunch of gossip and daggers and poison. I've watched it destroy one too many marriages. I've seen it tear apart families. I've seen, I've seen the stuff that, that, that gets texted out become such a distraction and such a distortion that relationships that should be healthy because you communicate face to face, we still ought to be doing that. It's not happening. Fatal distractions. Worse than any distraction that leads to a fatality is the harsh reality that many people have allowed the distractions to become spiritually fatal. They've allowed their vision to be distracted. When I start to, when, when I start to think about uh, uh, all the way that technology ha- is a blessing to people, I start to see how, how, how young people, it's such a curse to them. Believe it or not, I was an immature young person at one time. Now I'm just an immature old person. But when you start getting people playing around with things that, that, that honestly, it looks innocent, it looks easy, it looks fine, it looks, it looks, there, looks like there's nothing wrong with it. Would you really put your 8-year-old on the road with experienced drivers. I mean, just like there's driver's ed, sometimes I think think parents ought to get involved in (laughs) device ed. Several years ago, Brother Dennis Eastman used a term, and I, I haven't heard him use it for so long now, but, but I, I, I found it hilarious when he used it, and, uh, and it stuck with me. He called it the sinner net. Yeah. Yeah. And boy, hasn't it destroyed so many people. I see people having Facebook fights. cursing at each other, ripping people to shreds. The Bible forbids us to tear people down anyway. But I guess Facebook changes the rules. It's okay if it's done on Facebook. It's a fatal distraction. There, there are so many things that, uh, about these things that, that, that uh, I, I've seen, and, and they, can be, they, they can be done right. I see, some, I, I see some people putting out scriptures, and I see some people putting out encouragements, and, and uh, I, I tell you what, I, when, be, before the campaign, I thought everybody backslid. Oh, wow, I don't know if anybody's going to be in church anymore, Lord, because they've all backslid. They're so worried about who's going to be the next president. When did you stop being king? When did you stop being the king of kings? Samson is called to be a great deliverer of his people. Hear me, a deliverer of his people. He was a judge. He was a man, he, he was a man called of God to do incredible things for God and for God's people. Incredible things. 
He was not, by the way, called by God to become enslaved and kill himself along with the rest of them when he pushed the pillars over. That was not the will of God. That was not what God said. Oh, by the way, Samson, I want you to commit suicide. Get over that real quick. That was not the will of God. Especially when Samson, his last prayer was not, forgive me, Lord. It was, avenge me. It was a prayer of vengeance. Samson's called by God, just like every single one of us, to be a deliverer. Believe it or not, you are called to be a deliverer. You are a Moses in your day. You are called to be a witness, to call people out, to draw people out, to, to even sometimes even drag people out of the fire and out of the pits of sin. That's you and I. We are called to be deliverers, not distracted. We're not called to, to give ourselves over to, to all the things that this world has to offer that will kill us spiritually. We are called to build others spiritually. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I like using technology. But I don't like to see the distraction of technology. I don't like seeing how it distracts everybody. Now they're giving these, these devices out to the students in school, and then the principals are going crazy and the teachers are going nuts because the kids are not more productive. They're all playing on this and they're playing on that, and they can't get their work done, and what are we going to do? Well, I guess we'll just pay our union dues and let somebody else have a problem with it. I'd love to see some apostolic educators. People that could care less about what the school system is going to do for me personally and what can I do for students for the future. Isn't that, isn't that really what school is supposed to be? You know, it was Zig Ziglar that said the best way to get everything that you want is to help others get whatever they want. Samson called to be a deliverer of his people. God calls him to make a difference in the world. But he was distracted by lust. His first wife was a Philistine. Then he gets, he, after she's all gone and everything, our, our text opens up, he, he, he sees a harlot. And he goes in unto her. And three verses later, he's in love with Delilah. This guy is, a, is, is an absolute picture of somebody so worried about being Mr. Universe than he is about actually ministering to the nation that God called him to be a judge in. He's worried more about his testosterone than he is about the souls of the nation. His future is robbed by lust. He was distracted by lust. When you start to read about this guy, I mean, at first, the, the things that we like to read about Samson is he was big and he was tough and he was burly. And we, we failed to realize that he was a whoremonger. He was a dirt ball. He gave in to lust and all he did is chase women until it got him killed. That was not his purpose. That was what a distraction did to him.
The rich young ruler that, that came to Jesus asked, what, what shall I do? What must I do to be saved? And the Lord said, sell everything you have. Give it to the poor. Pick up your cross. Follow me. And he just, the only thing he had to do was, he, he went home and looked in his closet. No, I'm not getting rid of those. No, uh -uh. he looked in his garage. No, I don't think I'm going to get rid of that. He looks at his house. No, I don't think I'm going to get, I, you know, I, no. I've got too much. I've done everything else right. Sometimes you do everything else right. That's not what the Lord's looking for. He's looking for a right heart. He's looking for what you say is really what you mean. He hears that from the Lord and he said, I, I have too much, I have too much. Over the years, I've heard that preached so many times, and I've heard it heard it said how how, how big a U-Haul did he really have in his funeral possession, procession, because of all his possessions that he just couldn't part with. You've got to get to a place, church, when you recognize everything that you have is going to go somewhere else. I hate getting rid of stuff. I, am a, I, I, I hate getting rid of anything, especially if it's a tool. It's just hard. And right now we're, we're, we're looking at different things uh, as, as my, my family is. We're looking at different things. And, and my dad has more tools than, than most auto shops have. It's just amazing. And he doesn't need... Ha he, he doesn't need hardly any of them, but he doesn't like to walk more than 10 feet to get to a tool. And he's got a lot of 10-foot segments in his shop. So <laughs> my brothers and I were talking like, what are we going to do with all this stuff? His dad's talking, you know, he's, he's, he's talking about, you know, this is going to be your kids, this is going to be your kids, this is going to be your kids. And we're like, what are we going to do with it? Because we don't want to get rid of it, but none of us have the, the <coughs> we don't have sheds big enough. But we don't want to get rid of it. It's just, but I have to sit back and think. <laughs> Dad recognizes it's going to be somebody else's. I recognize it's going to belong to somebody else. You pass it from generation to generation if it's something that hangs around that long. Of course, we have things nowadays that, that we wear out so bad that the next generation just wants a dumpster to throw it in. It's amazing I hear about these estate sales where, where people are and there was just one out by where we live where uh, it's an estate sale. Somebody died and the family just brought in a dumpster. And people were pulling up to the dumpster and looking inside and pulling stuff out because they were throwing away all kinds of stuff. They didn't want it. They didn't want, they, they didn't want that stuff. They, they had no place for it. They just looked at it as it's not ours. It's junk. And, and, uh, and they just... Could you imagine the things that you spent so much money on, you worked so hard to get, others just throw it away? I'm reminded of a story that, uh, that I heard about um, a storage unit that was uh, a lady had moved away and put all of her stuff in this storage unit, and, and she had paid diligently. She had paid uh, every month. She was... She paid that thing just like clockwork, paid for that storage, and, and she had moved away, and she never, it was, it was over, it was over $5,000 she paid in storage fees, in storage fees, over $5,000 she had paid in storage fees, and, and, uh, <coughs> and, and
And anyway, she passed away, and her daughter called and said, yeah, if you want to, just if we owe you anything, just let us know. Otherwise, just, just throw it all away. Her daughter never even wanted to see what was in the storage unit. Just, if we owe you anything, let us know. Otherwise, just just throw it away. There could have been a Corvette in there for all she knew. She didn't even care. Didn't even ask a question. What's in it? Didn't even ask the question. Just says, yeah, just... Just, just get rid of it. We'll, we'll pay the disposal fee, whatever we have to. Don't, no problem. I can't imagine paying five thousand dollars to store something that other people just say, "I don't even care what's it, what it is. Just throw it away." I don't know. Five thousand dollars to me is still an awful lot of money. This y- rich young ruler, his possessions became his fatal distraction. Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of beans. Distracted by hunger, we prayed for hunger tonight, and I appreciate that, Sister Jerry Joe, but, but uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say anything against that. We need that kind of hunger that we prayed for tonight. But Esau was so hungry and so distracted by his belly that he sold his birthright. I mean, for the birthright, I could have ate a couple blades of grass. I could have found something to eat before I would sell my birthright. But somebody so distracted by a moment of hunger. Oh, he regretted it. He lived to regret it. He said, what does it mean to me? I'm about to die. I'll tell you, if I was about to die, carpet would taste good. I can't imagine after a day of hunting that he was really about to die anyway. He must not have had breakfast that day. was so frustrated because he didn't come home with a carcass to eat and to brag about his hunt and to and to show off everything that he was as a as a big hunter so frustrated by that that he demeaned and demoralized everything that had to do with his birthright and just said I'm about to die give me a bowl of beans Don't make emotional decisions. Because the birthright that you and I have is even greater than His. The birthright that you and I have is the name of Jesus Christ. It's, the, it's living in the blessings and the miracles of Almighty God. The birthright that you and I have is just signs and miracles and wonders and blessing and peace and joy. You cannot sell that. You just can't buy the truth, sell it not. But yet people will trade it for a moment of pleasure. They'll trade it for, 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 for a, a snake on the Internet. They'll trade it for a viper not knowing, not knowing that it's a viper. And, and I, I, don't, I can't even begin to tell you how many stories I've heard about, well, they're just not the person I met online. Who is? Who is? Esau sells his birthright for a momentary hunger. Watch out what makes you hungry. We live in a world where people are so media frenzied that they get so worked up and they get so hungry about things that are in Hollywood that they think their life has to be the same way. If you want to live like Hollywood, be prepared for the results of Hollywood. 
death by pills, death by suicide, death by alcoholism. Uh, you're, 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 you get killed, you get murdered, you have 15 spouses, you have 25 kids by, by, by people you don't even know anymore. You're, you, you make $5 million, but you have to pay out uh, $5.5 million in child support and alimony. Be prepared for Hollywood's results. You want to live like Hollywood? Be prepared for Hollywood's results. You can have anything you want, but watch out. The things that you want, you probably don't want after a while. God's trying to bring, his, bring Lot and his family out of destruction. Lot's wife turns back. She's turned into a pillar of salt. Because she allows herself to be destructed by what was in the past. Distracted, destructed, distracted, you know. She allows herself to be distracted by what was behind her. Man, we just, we cannot, we, we've got a Bible full of warning. It's full of warning. Distractions can be fatal. Distractions can cause somebody's dreams to be totally destroyed. Their future that never comes to pass. What God has called them to be. And they limp through life just, just barely surviving life. Not walking in the blessings that God is offering to them. Distractions can be the difference between what has become possible or what is possible and what has become reality. It's a simple thought. It's a simple thought. Don't let anything distract you from God. Don't let anything distract you from what the Lord has for you. Don't let anything get in the way of you and your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's amazing to me that you know, I, I, I like to sit and talk to people. People always ask me. They ask me questions all the time about my wife and I. They ask, I don't know, I, get, I don't get 20 questions. I get 2,000 questions about my wife and I. And I've got the greatest wife. It, she's, just, she's just incredible. But, but before, we, before we ever really decided anything about furthering our relationship, we decided on We had a ministry. I had a ministry. She had a ministry. Was our ministry going to be walking together? Were we going to go in the same direction? We decided on what our relationship with God was. How is our relationship with each other going to affect our relationship with Jesus Christ? Were we going to become so dependent on one another that we lost our dependency on Him? Were we going to have to need the other one to, 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 to drag us to church like a puppy dog? Come on, you got to come. Come on, you got to come with me. Come on now, you got to come with me. Now, I'm not going to go alone. You got to come with me. No, we're, no. That wasn't going to happen. If she couldn't be here, I could. If I can't be here, she can. We're not going to drag one another to church. We're not going to babysit one another spiritually. We, we, we had, we had, we'd settled it all up front. I was not looking for just a mama to my babies. I was looking for a wife. And if I was going to stand at the altar and, and actually give the vows for better or for worse, it better be for better or worse. I was going to have to have my, main, my mind made up that this thing can't fail. It can't. Now, she's a stubborn little girl. So even if I became stupid and wanted to quit, she, wasn't gonna, she wouldn't let me. She would remind me, hey, pal, uh-uh. Now, she's never going to have to get to that point, but I'm never going to have to do that to her. 
We're both stubborn enough to keep in this thing. We're just settled. We, we, we'd read this before time. Now we read it together. But we read it before time. We didn't wait till we were married and say, oh, by the way, um, you think maybe it's a good idea to read the Bible together? You think maybe we should pray together? You think maybe we should, you know, be married? No. We, we, just, we just recognize those were things that belonged to a Christian. I was a Christian before I was a husband. And now I'm just trying my best to be a Christian husband. But I'm staying a Christian and I'm staying a husband. You can't let anything distract you from your relationship with God. If, if, if a person is going to try to get you to stay out of church, set out of church, uh, uh, find, find other things to do besides church, get away from that joker. Because when you stand before God, that joker ain't going to be standing beside you. Don't let anything distract you from your relationship with Jesus Christ. So many people are distracted by their past. I mean, when you, when you think about it, everybody's got a past. Everybody's got a past. And so many be, people are distracted by their past, wondering if God can really use them, if, if he cares about them. You know, you've got to leave your past right there in the past. You've got to leave it in the past. It doesn't matter if you're raised in the church. If you think about your past, you're never going to do anything about for God. You could be raised a perfect saint of God and still have a past that says, yeah, no, no. I slept under the pew one time when I was 15. Well, maybe five. Slept on top of the pew when I was 15. <laughs> I can't do anything for God. Leave your past in the past. You got to, you know, Paul, we, we read it this morning. Paul, Paul said, no, I, I, I leave it behind. I leave it behind. By the way, you'll never return to yesterday. You'll never return to yesterday. So if you can't return to yesterday, stop living it today. You got to leave some things laying behind. Some people are distracted what has happened in their past, wondering if, ever God, if they're ever going to be the same again. I hope not. I hope you'll never be the same again. I hope I'll never be the same again. If I'm not growing, then I'm dying. I hope I'm never the same. I never want to be the same. I want to keep growing in the Lord because the same is, is compared to being lukewarm. And the last time I read that, God just kind of pukes it up. Some people ask, is my relationship with him ever going to be what it once was? I hope it isn't. Seriously. When you keep thinking of stuff in the past, if th Think about that. If, if all you want to do is go back to being a two-year-old, I don't think your spouse would enjoy that. They don't want to change your diapers. Your parents wouldn't enjoy that. You become a teenager and all of a sudden they want you to be two years old again. Are you kidding me? I'm not wanting to change your diapers and strap you in a car seat and stick formula down you. No way. I didn't train you to be a teenager just so you can be a two-year-old. I didn't invest everything into you to get you to grow a little bit just so you can backslide. You don't want to think about yesterday. Most of the time, the reason we got into church is because yesterday stunk. 
It was horrible. It had no hope. It had no future. It was miserable. People are distracted by thoughts and events that unfold in their life. Different things that happen in their life. Why did they have to die? Well, guess what? 100% of humanity dies. Forget asking why. Come to grips with it. We die. We're born. We live. We die. I don't like it, but as long as I'm living for God, I'm going to love being there. We just keep turning the same things over. The, the devil wants to depress us. I don't like it when people die, but to ask why? Well, because they were alive. I know that doesn't ease our pain. I know that doesn't, that doesn't settle well with us. But we've got to figure out, this, this book tells us how to live forever. But it never tells us how to live in the flesh forever. Because we weren't meant to. People ask, why do I have to go through that? Why, why am I going through this? Why will revival ever happen to me? Will I ever get my breakthrough? Will I ever recover from my situation? When you think about these things, they're all distractions to keep you suppressed. You don't want to live like what, like a, a poor, poor, pitiful me. I can't have this and I can't do that. You want to live like a child of God that says, the Lord is still reaching down to me. He's still pulling me up. He's still blessing my life. He's still giving me air to breathe. I might not be where I want to be, but I'm on my way. We can't let distractions become fatalities to us. The enemy just loves for us to be so caught up in our distractions that we miss what God is trying to do. We, li we live in a day where people are so overwhelmed, totally overwhelmed, um, unbelievably overwhelmed. We're overwhelmed by everything. We're overwhelmed emotionally. We're overwhelmed mentally. We're overwhelmed physically. We're just overwhelmed, overwhelmed. We're stressed out. We're stressed out. We're stressed out. We, we don't know how to rest. We don't know how to sleep. We, 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 we're, our, our bills are, are, are taller than we are. Our money is smaller than we are. We just can't figure this out. We can't figure that out. And we're, and we're, and we're, we're, pulling, we're, we're pulling everything that we can and Oh, by the way, the Lord wants your attention. You know, if we just get our lives in order spiritually, the rest of the stuff really doesn't mean that much. You just, you just pray through it. You walk through it. You move through it. You just recognize, yep, okay, you, you, you seek wisdom through it. You just, it, it, you just don't let it stop you. So many people are halted. They're stopped in their walk with God. Your walk with God is only going to be strengthened when you're actually working with God. Your walk with God does not become strengthened sitting in the chair. It doesn't. It becomes strengthened when you start reaching out to people, when you start loving people, you start teaching Bible studies. It becomes strengthened when all of a sudden, it, all of a sudden working with God is your focus. So well, I'm not going to be a preacher. So what? You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a preacher at all. You see, you see, we, we live in this we live in this stupid idea that we are supposed to multiply. And we think that's just physically. And we'll multiply physically forever and ever and ever. I mean, hey, I'm I'm gonna have twelve thousand babies and 
and that's okay. I'm just going to have 12,000 babies. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maybe, and those 12,000 babies, they'll figure out how to grow up. I don't know. Nobody ever taught me how to grow up. They'll figure out how to grow up. I, I don't have to be responsible for them. So uh, they just, we, in the physical, we just keep having babies. That's what we're supposed to do spiritually. Why don't you think about the next time you think about having a child that you ain't going to raise? Why don't you just go out and win a soul? And you can't stop and help, but, but uh, you, you can't help but try to do your best to raise them because when somebody falls out of the church, it feels a whole lot worse than falling out of the crib. Do what you're called to do, not what you're just trying to pleasure yourself doing. You know, that natural stuff kind of takes care of itself once you're married. But this doesn't take care of itself. This, you've got to be intentional, and you've got to go, and you've got to do. We're so distracted by all the, all the fleshly stuff that we forget the spiritual stuff. I am not going to be saved in this flesh. I'm not. Understand something. We, we, no matter what has happened to us, God is still God. He's still God. The enemy just wants you to be so distracted. He wants to rob you of your faith. He wants to rob you of your hope. But the Lord needs to be in control of our life. Well, I don't want anybody to control me. You're letting the devil control you now. If you're not doing the work in the will of God, then you're doing the work in the will of self. And that is the devil's priority. If he can get you selfish... Chasing after your own hopes and dreams. And don't get me wrong, your hopes and dreams need to be there. But they need to be seated right here. God has not left us. He's not forsaken us. He's still with us. We cannot let Satan distract us. We cannot. And everybody's looking at me like I'm chewing you. I'm not. I'm just sick and tired of the devil getting the upper hand. Some questions you have, you'll never get an answer for. Not here. But you know, when the trumpet sounds and we get out of here, <laughs> we're going to see it all unfold. We're going we're, we're gonna to see the brilliance of the artist. Right now, we spend our lives just, just looking and digging and, and trying, to, trying to get every answer. Well, the, the answers are here, but you're going to spend your whole life trying to find them all. So the answers we don't have here, we're going we're gonna to see when we get there. Don't worry about it. Trust God. When we come in the house of God, we can't allow distractions. We can't. We, we can't be, because they become fatal. They become fatal. I love to horse around. It, most of you know I like, to, I like to play. I like to laugh. I like to carry on. I like to cut up. But not in the house of God. Not, not during church. Because, it, you know, not, not during worship especially. During worship, if, if, if I don't get connected to God, I've just not just wasted my time but as your pastor I've absolutely wasted your time and when it comes to the altar if I'm not connected to God what, I might as well just go suck my thumb it's an absolute waste of everybody's time everybody's effort uh, you know I, I, I actually take a shower on Sundays and I, I, I come to the house of God to, 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 to work we can have a lot of fun, but 
But when I am in prayer or when I am worshiping the Lord, a distraction can prove fatal. So we can't we, we can't be doing that. We we can't be we, we can't be sitting around talking and chatting and, and and carrying on and carousing and 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 laughing and cutting up and making fun of people and you know and, and I was young. I used to I used to look at people on the platform and I'd be like, What in the world are they doing? And I'd I I'd, I'd kinda chuckle, but I would never I would never po- point it out to my neighbor. And start and, and try to start a laugh fest while everybody's worshiping. If I got distracted, I kept it to myself because I never want to be guilty of distracting somebody else away from their blessing. See, people who, who don't want to worship God, so they try to start conversations with everybody else so they can, they can chat and they can talk with everybody else because they themselves don't want to feel the conviction of the Spirit of God. Not only are you fatally distracted, but what about the person you're pulling away from the presence of God? God is still jealous. He doesn't want you taking anybody out of his presence. I'd hate to stand before the Lord and the Lord said, you know that time that you just didn't want to praise me and you didn't want to worship me and and you thought the the people beside you didn't want to either? He says, "Um, I was going to give them a huge blessing that night, but you distracted them. I don't want to stand before God and have that. I already carry enough garbage. That's not something I want to carry. I already carry enough challenge in my life. I already carry enough heartache in my life. I don't want to carry that. Every time we come to the house of God, we've got to focus on the Lord. We have, we have a lot of things that take our focus. But God deserves our attention. He deserves it. He deserves our praise. You may not see it physically. Doesn't mean God's not getting ready to do something spiritually. Don't let what you cannot see distract you from the fact that God is still in the midst of it. Don't let what you haven't received yet distract you from reaching for it again. This is not a let's beat up everybody service. It's not. It's not. But we have to get to the point where we put distraction aside. We got to get to the point where we just put it all aside and we focus on Jesus Christ. Because the trumpet's going to sound someday. And if we aren't listening... If we're, if, if we're busy running around doing 12 other thousand things, if we're not listening, if we're so busy just sitting around, you know, making sure all of our social people are still, you know, alive and kicking and, you know, our 12,000 friends that we don't know only but two of them on Facebook don't know that we're still, that we still matter. Are you kidding? They're not going to be at your funeral. They don't know you. We got to get, we got to set priorities. We have to set priorities. God is a good God. He's a good God. And all too often, we don't set a priority that he's a good God. We set a priority that, well, you know, Lord, you understand all the other stuff I got going on. Uh, I'll take five minutes on, you know, Thursday. Can we, can we get scheduled in? Hold on. Hold on. Are we so distracted by things that we're going to end up in the pits of hell because we didn't have time to spend with him? 
when he gave us time? Time he gave to us. He doesn't need time. We do. He gave it to us. It's a gift. And we can't let our gifts be used to do everything else except serve him. The Lord deserves the first fruits of everything, not just your paycheck, not just your house or your car or your land or, or your, your tax return. He deserves the first fruits of everything. And that means my time. My time belongs to him. He can stop it at any moment. I wanted to shout tonight. I still can. Our failures aren't final. Unless we're distracted fatally. We can't, we, 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 we've got, we're, we're going into, we're, we're going into a brand new year. We really are. We're going into a brand new year. We're going into a brand new gift. Amen. We're going into an absolute brand new gift. I, I, I think it's fantastic when God gives us a gift of another year. I think it's tremendous. But this year, if we just lay it all out, let's just put it under the blood, can we? Because it's been painful for so many people. Let's just put it under the blood. Just recognize, I can't relive it. I don't want to relive it. A lot of things that happen to, to a lot of people sitting here tonight, I don't want it to ever return back to you. I don't want any heartache to ever come back to you. I don't want any struggle to ever come back to you. I don't want any pain to ever come back to you. I don't want bruises to show up in the middle of the night to come back to you. I don't want scars to, to all of a sudden just reappear again after God has healed them. I don't want any of that stuff to come back, and I'm not going to revisit it. I'm going to put it under the grave, and I'm going to leave it buried under the grave. But this coming year, I've got brand new breath. I've got brand new vision. I've got, I've got brand new fresh word from the Lord. It, it, I shouldn't say brand new I, it, because it's still the word of God. But, but we've, we, we've got something brand new. We've got a brand new step to take. We've got another year to do something even greater for God. Yeah. And if I'm going to allow a distraction in my life to take me down, I'm going to just relive 2016. 2016, has, uh, although the Lord has blessed us incredibly, the Lord has given us incredible victories. A lot of us here have gotten incredible victories. But overall, this has been a detriment for our nation. It's been a, it's been, it's been a crush on our nation. It has destroyed people's homes. It has destroyed people's families. It has messed them up. It, is, it has just hurt them so badly. It, they, they, the, our nation is incredibly divided right now. It's unbelievable. And, and, and politics is to blame for some of it, but distraction is to blame for 100% of it. 100% of it is because we got distracted. We become distracted as a nation. Instead of being in church, instead of being on our nose, instead of being in prayer, instead of being in the book, instead of living the promises of God, we start buying into the media garbage. And we're so distracted that we, we, in our personal lives, we're just walking around limping. We're walk, walking around. We're so overwhelmed. We're so depressed. We're so burdened. We're so stressed out. We're so maxed out financially. We just can't do this. We can't do that. We can't. Where are the miracles of God happening? Because they're going to happen through your faith. Through your step into the kingdom, through your faith, through your praise, through your worship, through your obedience to the word of God. I'm excited about the miracles we've seen, but we haven't come close to what God is trying to do. 
I don't want a miracle just to hit the front row. I want a miracle to hit Lacrosse County. I want a miracle to flow across Wisconsin and Minnesota and Iowa and Illinois. I want a miracle to sweep over our nation. I want a miracle to sweep over our world. I'm looking for worldwide revival. I'm not looking for personal revival. I'm going to have that. I've already made up my mind. It doesn't matter. I'm serving the Lord regardless. So I'm going to have personal revival. I'll have personal prayer. I'll have personal fasting. I'll have personal devotions. I will live in personal revival. I've already made up my mind. It's not going to knock me down. But as a church, you've got to make up the same mind. You can't be distracted fatally. When it comes to Facebook, give yourself about 10 minutes a day. No more, no less. 10 minutes a day is all I'm going to give to this stupid thing. If you've got LinkedIn, maybe 10 minutes a day. If you've got uh, what, what Instagram or all those other silly things, maybe 10 minutes a day. I guarantee you those folks aren't going to pick up a phone and talk to you that long so why do you gotta text that long if they can't have meaningful conversation then you don't need them for a friend but why don't you give at least two hours a day to serving the holy God we can't be so distracted that we find ourselves just dropping a level a level a level a level a level and still all of a sudden we're at the same playing field as the serpent i've been called to step on serpents not crawl around with them We've got to rise to a new level. We've got to be excited about what God is doing. We've we got to be excited about what God is going to do in our family and our friends. Oh, by the way, yes, He wants to save them. And He's got to use you to do it. You have the truth. You have the message that's going to reach them. Who else is going to reach them? Only the ones with the truth. And God has given you the truth. Come on. We can't be distracted. God is on our side. He's on our side. He doesn't want these distractions to be fatal. We've got, we sang that old song, Get Your Mind on Jesus. And it used to be kind of a chuckle. What we're doing, we're sitting in church. Well, our mind is already on Jesus. Why we got to sing about it? Well, maybe we ought to recycle that because so many people come to the house of God, but they don't come to the God of the house. Stand with me, would you? He's still God. He's still desirous of us. He still has a job for us to do. He still has the business of the kingdom. I, I, I never want to get so distracted that, that the blood of Jesus Christ is vain. That it's on me, but it doesn't matter if it gets on anybody else. I never want to get to that point. I never want to get to the point where, where my family and friends don't know what I possess. Would you come around the altar tonight? I never want to get to the place where they don't know what I possess. I had a friend that came in the church roughly the same time I did and, and her and I were we're pretty good buddies, and my pastor was always trying to get me to marry her, and I told him he's crazy because, because <clears throat> her and I couldn't sit in a room together without, without wanting to fight, and uh, she was just crazy. She was a great friend, but she never more than anything else, and, and uh, he says, well, you can tame her. I says, I, I, I don't have that kind, of, that kind of time in my life. No way. She was, she was a wonderful person. She really was. She was incredible. She was a, she was a, 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 a state, uh, what do you call those? She, she 
played basketball for the state of Texas. She was a star. She had trophies that lined all the walls, and she was just a, a tremendous athlete and, and all that stuff. And she was, she was pretty popular uh, where she came from. I was, you know, pretty popular where I come from. When you only have 49 people, you know, in your graduating class, you're going to be popular. But... Uh, <coughs> But anyway, it, it was, you know, we, we both kind of came out of similar backgrounds. and We came into church at the same time, and, and, uh, and, and really we, we, we both fell in love with the Lord. We fell in love with everything about God, and, and, and I moved away, and she, uh, but I, I moved to a church, and she moved to the street. And uh, she ended up marrying a, uh, an Army officer, or excuse me, a Navy officer, and... Uh, and he was uh, a decent guy, um, but he had no idea what she possessed. She ended up having four boys. Not one of them have any idea what she possesses. Her two oldest kids are out of high school now and out of out of the home. They're one of them, I think, is in college. I don't know. It's been a few years since I've heard anything about her, but um, there. But I know that she's got two of them out of high school and and uh, and out of the out of the house, grown and out of the house, and they have no idea. They have no idea today what their mother possesses. They have no idea that girl that used to dance and worship God, and she got so excited about what she had found. They had no idea. The last conversation I had with her. She, she said something to me. She says, I just want to, I just want to someday, I want to get back and I want to get right with God. I says, does anybody in your family know who you are? She said, no. That broke my heart. I said, you cannot, you cannot let them go to hell without knowing who you are. See, when you're baptized in Jesus' name, you, you are a citizen of a kingdom that is absolutely set apart. You're a citizen that's not of this world. When you take on the name of Jesus Christ, your identity shifts and you become somebody completely different than who you were. You may not be in your mind, but you are in the book and you are in the kingdom. You're adopted into the kingdom of the Most High God. You've got a Father that spoke everything into existence. And it's something more than just, just saying, now I lay me down to sleep type of Father. It's a Father who was with you every single moment of your life. He's a Father that was there at the creation of the world and He is going to be there forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. You've got a father that can't be a drunk. He can't be, he, he can't get divorced and run off on your mother. You've got a father that will never, can never, can never leave. You've got a father that absolutely watches over you. He can't get mad at you and kick you out of the house. He can't, he, he can't force you to do anything. He'll never abuse you. He absolutely is opposed to anything molesting you. He's a father that you have. You have got the name of Jesus Christ. You've got His blood. You've got His Spirit. You have His promises offered to you. Everything is there. You've got everything, everything 
You've been born again. You've had your sins removed farther than the east is from the west. He's, he's removed them. You've got every promise from